Hello and welcome to the 23rd edition of the Techno Crime Fighters Forum. We have been struggling all morning to try to make this happen. After I got my uh, Google Hangout, uh, it's not term, it's suspended, restricted. So I can't come on. We have been struggling all morning to try to make this happen. Okay. After I got my, uh, there we go, I had that on, I'm sorry about that. So uh, here we are. I hope all of you made the transition over to Ramola D reports from Pinecone Utopia. What we'll do is we'll download this and we'll post this on Pinecone Utopia also. Uh, if you haven't subscribed to Ramola's channel, this is a good time to just stop and do that. Uh, we're going to probably issue a lot of things through there. Uh, she also has uh, done some stunning interviews. Uh, Within the last couple of days, she did one with Ed Spencer and then one with Oli Damagard and Seven. So those are there for you to watch. So subscribe so you know when she's listing stuff. Okay, well, here we are, Techno Crime Fighter Forum 23. And uh, we're off the ground and we're started. We have 12 people watching already. Uh, <laughs> I'm in the room with seven dogs, large dogs, because uh, the fence in the backyard is broken and the fence in the front yard is being fixed. So here they are with me on Techno Crime Fighters Forum. Uh, so this could be pretty rollicking with with them. Every time well, something, every time well, something. Uh, go ahead. It, it it sounds like it sounds like today you've got seven you know seven dogs and nine hounds with you. That's right. Okay, there we go. I can see your beautiful face. Okay, well, uh, how should we start? See, I I think we were thinking um, to start with a round of updates because I think um, today's um, forum will be totally packed with news and uh, investigative leads um, that we wanted to talk about. So I think um, Dr. Milson Black isn't coming today because um, she is um, you know, doing some investigative work um, today. And I think um, Karen, I'm not sure if she's coming maybe later. I haven't actually gotten in touch with her. So um, I think uh, Ramola and I will get started. Um, but I think um, I, I would like to um, let Ramola start because she has done some absolutely amazing work um, the last, uh, you know, the last week, and it's absolutely mind blowing. So I think she should start and talk about what she's achieved. Oh, thanks, Catherine. Thanks, everyone. Good morning to everybody. Uh, well, first of all, this is my first time hosting this at Ramola D Reports, and we're doing this just because we've been having problems with um, um, Google Channel, his uh, his Chrome browser, and so forth. So kind of exciting and it's kind of <laughs> a little scary to be doing this but I'm hoping that everything goes well and we'll be able to record this uh, you know just as we hope and um, it will work just as planned um, so first of all so what I've been doing um, well one of the things I just wanted to announce was that you know I've set up this YouTube channel called Romology Report and the reason I called it that is not because I want my name in there but just because I've been running a website for three years called the everyday concerned citizen and I've been trying to collect all of my um, focused journalism around various topics um, under this particular menu item, Ramola D slash report. So when it came time to kind of christen my YouTube channel, I just took that name and stuck it over there. So it's Ramola D report. So people know what it's about. So basically, my hope for this YouTube channel is simply to do podcasts in connection with my reportage at Everyday Concerns. Where I'm coming from. Um, so I just wanted to, to mention a couple of things that I have done. Recently published a fabulous interview with Sherry Guarneri, who is an absolutely wonderful person, um, a human rights advocate. She uh, is an elder care advocate and an Alzheimer's patients advocate. She spent many years taking care of her grandmother in Massachusetts and Connecticut. Um, and her grandmother lived, I, I forget the exact age to which she lived. I think it may have been 101. It was past 100. Um, but uh, Sherry was the sole healthcare proxy and power of attorney taking care of her grandmother in these facilities. 
And while she was doing that, she came, she began to discover that the care was not really up to par. And um, she began to discover all sorts of incredible, incredibly difficult to comprehend anomalies and aberrations, such as bruises on her grandmother, which the staff could not explain. And things like that. Um, so she began to look into it, she began to explore it, and she began to discover <clears throat> that her grandmother, like many other patients in those facilities, were actually being dosed with um, these antipsychotic drugs on a regular basis, things like Seroquel, just to keep them docile and compliant. Because the staff were seeming apparently doing things just to keep the, the people, the patients, quiet and keep the routine going, keep the status quo operative or something like that. So, you know, she embarked on a whole process of reporting these problems, both to the Massachusetts Department of Public Health, to, their, to the ombudsman there, to, to various um, overseeing organizations. She contacted state representatives, senators, congressmen. She wrote to President Obama, all sorts of things. And um, for her efforts, unfortunately, she suffered incredible retaliation. She started to experience stalking, surveillance, harassment. And this followed her even after she moved away, even after her grandmother passed on. And she moved away, she left the Northeast, and she went to the Southwest. She went to New Mexico. And um, at, at New Mexico, she was in fact visited um, by the Secret Service. Before she left Massachusetts, however, she also experienced a particular form of extreme harassment that many people are reporting today, and that is synthetic telepathy. And the onset of her synthetic telepathy, which is the use of military neural weaponry to induce voices in the head, um, was very dramatic and traumatic. So all of that is spelled out in the interview. What those voices said to her, and they were very rude, very aggressive, and what really happened around the incident, that particular incident when she suffered that first onset. After which she wrote again to the White House and mentioned this incident. Because she mentioned this incident, and because of the terms in which she mentioned this incident, perhaps, she experienced this visit from the Secret Service. And it was kind of a wild visit because the Secret Service came to her neighborhood and started to talk to the people around where she lived, questioning them on her, saying things like, have you seen her carry a gun back and forth? And the neighbors said, do you mean a yoga mat? Because Sherry is an avid yogi and a yoga enthusiast who does yoga five times a week. And then the Secret Service man asked this uh, lady, um, and have you seen her carrying bags, suspicious looking bags in and out of the house? And the neighbor said, oh, you mean her recycled uh, grocery bag? <laughs> so you can tell to what length these guys were going to try to build up this image, this false defamatory slanderous image of this wonderful yogi and human rights advocate as some kind of terrorist. And that, in a nutshell, is exactly what's going on in our country today. You know, so her interview is so vastly important. And I have been so um, pleased that she's come forward to tell her story. And, you know, this is sort of the first half of the story that I've relayed. So I do encourage everybody to go to my website, everydayconcern.net, and read the rest of the interview, read the whole interview, because there is some disclosure in there that is completely mind blowing about the participation of people in very high places in this kind of targeting, surveillance, and harassment of ordinary civilians, ordinary citizens. So that's, that's Sherry's interview. I also did a few podcasts, and you know, um, Paul did a great job mentioning those podcasts. I spoke to Dr. Ed Spencer in a wonderful conversation where he talked about his run-ins with the medical establishment early on. Um, He's a retired neurologist who has a fabulous education from Stanford and Yale and the University of California. And he's worked in California for many years. And uh, he spoke to me about his run-ins with the medical establishment when he began to research vaccines, especially the swine flu vaccine, and when he started speaking out to his colleagues. And suddenly it appeared that he was invoking the wrath of his colleagues and the wrath of the hospital administration. It kind of came down on him heavily. And um, instead of listening to him, instead of taking his uh, research seriously, 
instead of exploring the subject themselves as doctors, you would think, as educated professionals in the medical healthcare field. They, um, uh, they put the physician's well-being committee after him. Now, if that sounds like something out of communist Russia, um, that's probably not a coincidence because unfortunately that appears to be what's happened in our hospitals. So even doctors who are beginning to see the truth are being shut down or have been shut down because I think what, um, what Dr. Ed uh, experienced was some decades ago. You know, it's not, it's not immediate because he's a retired uh, doctor. Um, but I would imagine that this kind of thing goes on still. And, and that's one of the issues, the areas certainly that I'm interested in finding out more about. So I do want to actually talk with doctors today and see what the atmosphere is like today in hospitals. And perhaps that's something I'll explore further, you know, with Dr. Ed's help, because I know he's got contacts in that field. Um, so he also talked about, you know, he's a retired neurologist. So to me, it's vastly interesting to talk to a neurologist about neural weapons. And so this is one of the first things um, that we are going to continue to talk about. We haven't yet covered this particular subject in great detail, but I'm hoping we'll do part two and part three of that conversation and cover some of these issues. Uh, one of the things he did talk about was Morgellons. He did a lot of research in Morgellons, and he was going to give a um, talk at a conference, at an international conference, and he was hit with a car accident. A woman literally crossed over and hit him head on. She crossed over from, you know, the side of the road that she should have been driving on, and she crossed over to his side and hit him head on. Um, and it was a bad car crash, and so he was unable to go to this conference. Uh, various forms of retaliation. So, you know, that's, an, uh, that's a very uh, important podcast, I think, that I did with him, and I encourage everybody to, to watch that. And there were a couple other podcasts I did. Dr. Millicent Black has started to give her testimonial in video format, and I've, and I've recorded two conversations with her. And as people may know, I've done that interview with, um, or rather, I didn't do an interview with Millicent, did I? I did an article, right? I wrote a long-form article, and it's on my website, everydayconsent.net. It's, um, Electronic Slavery in America is the short form title. And then I also did this conversation with Ole Damagard and Seven, and we were looking at false flag terror events that are currently playing out on the world map today, you know, in Charlottesville, in Barcelona, the Grenfell Tower catastrophe and disaster. And um, our conversation ranged really from looking at what's happening in these false flag events, because one of the things Ole Damagard was pointing to is that. Uh, his research has uh, led him to the understanding that in all NATO countries, false flag events have been rolled out on a regular basis by the same production unit. It's almost like a film crew or a pop crew, pop band crew, just traveling country to country and staging these events. And he named three companies that he had found. And, you know, he put their, na I put their names up underneath the video. CrisisSolutions.com is one. I think NC4 and um, the other one may be Bell Pottinger. I may be misremembering that name, but that's I think it was in there. Um, so we talked about that, about how this is false flag terrorism production. And it's being run by a combination of intel agencies, media and film units. Right? So the media is involved. And so I am very interested in talking more and more about the media. And I you know, would really like to talk to everybody I could possibly find who can tell me more about how the media has been infiltrated and why the media is actually acting against humanity. Because so I was very interested about that. You know, this Catherine, is just, do you have a point? Yeah, just to interject on the media, this is, this is very interesting yeah. because um, there are several yeah. other independent leads that also point towards um, the media. And um, one of them is, for example, these blog co posts called MI5, MI6 Exposed, where um, these, what I sounds like agents, talk um, openly about um, high profile people in the media being trained MI5 and MI6 agents. So they go through the same training program and then they get planted everywhere in public life you know they get these positions and media is one of the um and advertising actually um and it turns out that people who are heading you know high profile advertising agencies i mean that's also kind of mind control you know perception management media companies um you know high profile host um talk show hosts and 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 
are actually intelligence agents, you know? So this yeah. is, shows how interwoven they are, you know? Yeah. Before we, get, before we get too far into this, let me interject something uh, on doctors, that whole, uh, Janice Barcello has a program called The Birth of a New Earth. That's her channel. And uh, she interviews doctors all the time. She exposes vaccines. Also, the myth of brain dead. Brain dead was uh, invented to create uh, uh, venues for organ transplants. Brain dead is a scientific term adopted by Harvard Medical School to facilitate organ transplants. You can't transplant a heart from a dead patient. And, uh, and I can, she's a good friend of mine, and I'll set you up with her, and she's got a ton of doctors to, uh, oh, wow. to talk to on that. Uh, I would birth love of a new Denise Barcello. Also, uh, Oli and I, about maybe a year ago, made a, <laughs> made a video called How to. Hey, hey! How to produce a false flag attack. It's on our channel, Pinecone Utopia, and it goes through. He's even talked about pro they use product placement. That's how slicked up this thing is. They'll put a Citron in or a bottle of some, some for product placement because they know it will be shown over and over again. It's a good interview too. Uh, thank you, Oli. But anyway, I wanted to interject that because I know Catherine's got a, a load of stuff and I wanted to get in here before we started in that. So thanks. Now I'll shut my mic off and my dog's off and, and we can go from there. Paul, thanks so much. That's great. And I will look, out, look up her channel and perhaps we can put the link below this video as well so other people can look it up as well and see her interviews. And that's a wonderful um, video as well from Oli Damaga that we can look at. Because yes, he talked about Nike trainers being left at these false flag events too as a sort of a Masonic sign as well. So, but one of the things he did talk about in that conversation with me also was um, with, with that both Seven and he talked about is that, you know, we've come to the point where these people are, are um, running such terrible false flag events on us where people are actually being killed. You know, the Grenfell Tower fire was an extreme disaster. Hundreds of families actually lost their lives. Children lost their lives. And if this is connected to satanic ritual sacrifice and all of that weird satanism that, you know, these, um, the people at the top of these pyramids are practicing, then we as humanity need to start speaking out and we need to say, no, this is not acceptable and you have to stop. So I know Seven is actually doing something brilliant in that regard. She sent me a huge document which I have not had time to read in completion. I'll send it over to both of you, actually, because I think it's a very important document. I'm going to post it on my website. Um, it's literally about how we need an inquiry and we need to start speaking out for humanity. We need to stop with these fake commissions that do nothing and go nowhere. We need to get real about really addressing the needs of humanity and stopping ritual sacrifice, stopping the Satanism that's being practiced in our midst. Um, you know, and so they both had wonderful ideas for solutions as well in that podcast, which is why I, I particularly would love for people to, to listen to the latter part of that podcast. It's all about how everybody in the world is needed, even those people who are acting against us. They need to kind of switch sides. They need, and, you know, Ole literally directly address the people at the top of the pyramid, saying, you have trillions of dollars. The longer you wait to come over to our side, the less patient people will be and the more extreme your punishment will be now Ole is all about love and light and about you know truth and reconciliation and open arms and generosity but he said not everybody is humanity at some point will react and may react badly so it's time for all of these trillionaires and billionaires at the top of the pyramid to start waking up and start putting their money to good use and start coming over to the side of humanity so I thought that was such a brilliant and a wonderful message, you know, to, to put out there. Catherine? What I was doing um, as you were speaking is I was trying to find a link that I posted um, in before one of my, um, below one of my videos. 
Um, and that's uh, because for many people um, who maybe are new to false flags and stage events and all this sort of stuff, it's very hard to comprehend at first. Um, but I think um, people who just search for false flags, you know, will find stuff about 9-11 and 7-7 in uh, London and pretty much every single big major terrorist event. Um, there are lots of leads and, um, you know, there's just some mind-blowing examples but what's what's really nice and encouraging is that as soon as um some big ter terrorist event happens somewhere around the world by now a few hours later you can go online and just search the title of that terrorist event um followed by false flag and then you will find usually excellent excellent videos made by private people or who knows maybe you know intelligence agents who want to have this stuff you know finally wrapped up um and and where they take it absolutely apart you know to bits and using information from all sorts of sources and and really um, deconstructing it and showing it why it's total nonsense so um what i was looking for was um actually two links one of them is um there was a terrorist event um so it happened exactly on the day of my second um high court hearing it was the 19th of june where um a british parliamentarian called joe cox um, and then one can think about the coding in that name perhaps um she was in parliament for just one year and then she was supposedly murdered um, by somebody who's since been trialed um, and he was called a loner and he supposedly suddenly went mad and then killed her or stabbed her or something. Okay, but you know, that's that's a big story and lots, lots of details to take apart. But what's very interesting is that um, they showed um, the arrest of this person and in the footage um, you can see it was supposedly filmed from an upstairs bedroom um, and it was just, you know, just right, just filming the corner when the police arrived, you know, just perfectly timed, as it usually is the case with these men. But what's absolutely amazing is that um, one can see the person who supposedly committed the murder being, you know, kind of, I think, sitting on the pavement, if I remember correctly, um, with two police officers. And then literally within seconds, I think half a dozen of police um, cars arrive. And some of them actually with blue lights and actually marked as police cars and some actually one, I remember one really big black four by four unmarked with um, blue lights. And they literally arrive like in the films, all six cars just within seconds. Now, you know, people pointed out that um, when you get an emergency call, these people are scattered. Um, throughout London you know some people have to get into their cars some people have to make it in, into traffic and it is virtually impossible for people to arrive within seconds given the London traffic unless of course these cars were parked around the corner and just waiting for their you know arrival and then the other thing um, that real police officers pointed out is that um, in this footage you can see that the police cars arrive and then within moments they all switch off their blue lights and that's it and then they say this is absolutely against the rules because when you go to an act, you know, you actually go to a scene, by law, you have to keep the blue lights on. Um, and this is, you know, to such an extreme extent that even if you go is somewhere and it's something utterly benign and it's pretty clear you don't need blue lights and it's the middle of the night, you turn up at 3 a.m., you still have to leave the blue lights flashing and waking everybody up in the neighborhood. And people complained about that regularly. And police officers say, no, we have to do it to show that this is an active, you know, an actual um, engagement we have. And then you can see in this film, supposedly a really big major event, you know, in London. And they've been chasing this person. So it must be, you know, high, this guy just stabbed an MP, must be the highest level, you know, of alert. And then these guys just arrive and, and behave like a bunch of amateurs, you know. It's, it's total nonsense. And as soon as this is, you know, broadcast, you can take it to bits. And, and the other thing that I noticed also is that I think there was a rucksack in the middle of the street still, you know, scattered. And these police cars, literally, I think one almost drives over it. And you think, hang on, is there any consideration towards we have to kind of secure evidence? You know, you can't just drive in with six cars, you know, and just drive over evidence but no consideration given and the entire scene once you think about it for longer than three seconds literally looks like um mi5 had this task of staging something 
And they were like, right, we have to do it like the Americans, you know, it has to look cool and action, you know, and they were like, how are we going to make it look cool and action? And they must have watched, you know, CIS Miami or whatever it's called, CSI Miami. Oh, my God. And, you know, once you see one false flag, I think it will it will kind of inoculate you forever for life, you know, to ever believe this nonsense ever again. And then I think it's um, up to us to literally look at the event, take it apart. And then once we convinced ourselves that it is indeed a staged um, event, to start the investigation backwards and start asking questions like, what does it mean? What does it mean for democracy when these, when the so-called security services are pulling off these staged events with the, with the specific goal of, of cheating and lying to the rest of the supposedly sovereign, you know, citizens. Um, and media helps them. Pardon? Media helps them. Yes, and media helps them. You know, the, the entire shots on the BBC, you know, I mean, if, if you're really a reporter and you have worked for the BBC for decades and you've seen it all, you know, um, surely you would ask these same questions that normal people ask who make these YouTube videos, you know. But no editorial oversight, nothing. It gets broadcast, and um, it just shows that the media is just a front for the intelligence agencies by now, you know. So that's one thing um, I wanted to um, to actually uh, post. Unfortunately, I didn't actually have the time to find the link. But the other thing that I posted somewhere below one of my videos I made is also very instructive because. Um, it's very interesting that you mentioned particular companies being involved in literally staging, you know, this these sort of events um, like film crews, because I believe I found evidence for just the, the, the training of young people for these sort of events, which was um, a, a very, very odd um, incident that happened at the protest. So there was a protest against domestic violence in London, and there was this very odd scene that was reported, I think, in The Guardian, about um, literally um, a guy and a woman um, staging what looked on the surface like a, a, a you know a misogynist attack or a, you know a domestic argument or whatever you want to call it, and this guy ended up bottling the woman next to the pro protesters, and she collapses on the floor. And then as soon as the um, other genuine protesters start questioning the scene. He totally panics and say and says, "Oh, she's a she's a prostitute. She's a prostitute. This is all just um, you know a staged thing." But then, when you when you listen to this, I mean, he claims she's a prostitute. Then he it was claimed that this was some sort of social experiment for a radio show, and the entire thing doesn't make any sense. And in one of my videos, I deconstruct it, and the only actual rational explanation I could find for that odd scene was that it was actually MI five agents practicing staging events you know um and and for me it's very important to look at that video and study it closely because you know, these people don't just uh, grow on trees they have to be trained up and i think a lot of what targeted individuals and the victims of the intelligence agency see is that they are taken as props and as guinea pigs to train up entire armies of young people to attack them you know, and and I can talk about that later a lot of what I've seen the last couple of weeks. But I think you're you're very right to point out the complicity of media, and I think it's also very important to stress that staged events in a democracy are actually a form of high treason, because they are staged with the express intent of misleading other voters, of gravely misleading them and misleading them potentially into wars as it has been done in the past and that is high treason so what we're talking about here is the media being complicit in high treason it is and i'm glad you put it in those terms Martin, because that is absolutely the truth um if you look for instance at the coverage in newspapers in um on television network news sites and so on um, you see people with, you know, um, degrees after their name. These are credentialed opinion leaders, thought leaders in the community, or people who are projecting themselves as such, such you know, at writing editorials, writing columns. The news writers, the people who are just presenting the news as is from the point of view of the stage terror terrorists, whom we can safely say at this point are indeed these private companies working for the intelligence 
working for media who are running the group. Just, so, just briefly, I think you have to restart your microphone because on my end, at least, it started vibrating really hard. Um, so okay, I can. You tell me now. Uh, I, I, it's, it's still vibrating. I'm not sure if it's, it's my mic. Okay, okay, I'll tell you what. Why don't you keep talking? I'll go out and come. No, no, I can't go out because no, I don't no, want to go out. Okay. Maybe just press the mute button and then restart. I think this is again. Oh, okay, yeah, let me. Sabotage. It just oh, happened. No, you know, they've been, they've been trying to cut out my mic every, every one of my appearances in the last couple of techno channels, and I've been used to going out and coming in to make it work again. That I can't do right now because I'm running the broadcast. So I think if I have a problem, I'll just mute and let you guys talk. All right? Yeah. So yeah. Okay. at That's this point, can you tell me okay? You don't like the solution. You can't be muted, Ramola. I think you can't be removed. The other option that you have is if you have maybe two microphones, if you have a webcam or something, if you connect the webcam, it might have a second microphone. And then I you have a webcam, it doesn't have a second microphone, uh, but I have another another headset and the USB port, so I could try that. Yeah, maybe maybe try connecting that, and then you know I will try to fill in whilst you wait. So if you if you do that now, I will just report about what happened to me, and then we take it from there. Okay, sounds good. Yeah. Um, so okay, so in in the meantime, sorry to interrupt, uh, Ramola. Um, but um, just very very briefly, I will just update um, people on what um, has happened to me. So there are some pretty big news, I think, all around. Um, I have um, people maybe remember from previous episodes. I had this um, very odd um, uh, letter exchange with the so-called Inspector Miskell um, at uh, Man Greater Manchester Police. I've been asking for my crime report since December. Then um, when I called the actual central um, you know, um, helpline, they, they confessed that they decided not to crime it, as in they decided not to class um, the fact that I reported a violent um, assault on me with microwave weapons as a crime. Um, and then eventually I managed to get through to a person who is claimed to be Inspector Miskell, and I spoke to him on the phone and I also recorded the phone call and um, it's very, very, very odd, I have to say. So, um, um, so it's, it's um, I don't even know where to start. So I've already said that I've got my serious doubts about Inspector Miskell being actually for real. I think he's just, um, I, I suspect he's actually a fake MI5 character. Um, and that's because when I looked on the Greater Manchester um, website, Inspector Miskell is the only one who's not listed. So under police.uk and under the Greater Manchester Police um, website, there are photographs of most of the inspectors and all of them are listed, I think, by station. Now, I couldn't find an Inspector Miskell at all. I've clicked my way through, you know, half of Greater Manchester Police um, stations. So he's not there. That's already very odd. But what was extremely odd is what I reported in the past, which is that um, he was speaking at the funeral um, of, uh, of two police or one of the police um, ladies who died um, in this in I think she was murdered in a burglary together with another young um, um, police officer and um, that was very odd because the um, Daily Mail article I think it was um, was reporting it as a great sacrifice in inverted commas now that should already set off alarm bells but what also set um, off alarm bells in the um, article is the um, what I would call, you know, a Freemason slash Illuminati slash cartel signaling in the entire Daily Mail article, because at the very top, they show a little girl who's holding a five-pointed star in, in the article. Maybe I can even bring it up. Um, so there was a lot of coding where I thought, hang on a second, this is a bit too much, uh, you know, wooliness. Hang on, let me just bring it up. So it was the great uh, sacrifice inspector on Miskel. Um, and um, yes, so let me just share my screen so that people um, see what I'm talking about, just briefly to update people. Um, oh God, Daily Mail. Let me let me get the article. Um, so that yes, that's that's what it was. It was. Um, so the Telegraph reported it as a great sacrifice, and the Daily Mail was um, had this really odd reporting. So they showed 
the same scene. So first of all, it started off with a little girl showing a five pointed star, which is a, you know, the pentagram, it's the satanic symbol. Then they had virtually the same image three times, one after the other. And in the third one, um, the, the um, I think it was the father of one of the, um, uh, you know, the, the person whose funeral it was, um, he was holding his hand like that. So it kind of, on one hand, it's this sort of symbol, but on the other hand, he's also holding three fingers. So again, the, the symbol three. And then what topped it all off is, um, you know, there were other little details in the article, but what really got, got me was that um, supposedly Inspector Steve Miskell's partner who also spoke at this funeral died pretty much exactly a year later, whereby it was reported in the um, Manchester Evening News that they came home from the gym and she collapsed and died um, there. So you have the death of three women all interconnected. It's called the Great Sacrifice. It's announced with a you know a pentagram in the Daily Mail, and you know you've got all the symbolism. So and and imagine. I happen to travel to, to Greater Manchester. I happen to report a microwave attack. And then I happen, you know, to, my case happens to be treated by Inspector Misko, right, whose um, partner supposedly died, you know, I think in 2013 by something that could very well be an, you know, an electromagnetic attack that gives people an instant heart attack. Otherwise, it's really, really odd. So imagine, it's, it's a bit too many coincidences, I have to say. So um, what I did is eventually I did um, talk to Inspector Miskel. I recorded the phone call. In the phone call, I asked him, you know, is, am I allowed to publish this? And he says, you can do what you want. It's a free country. I'm not sure about the free country, but, but he certainly gave me permission to publish it. So I will publish the phone call. And I still would like to know from the people of Manchester if this guy is for real. Because my explanation is that he's not, that he's actually a fake police officer. Um, a character used for staged events because that, um, you know, it could be that these police, police officers genuinely died, these young women, but they were maybe used for one of these human sacrifice rituals. Um, or maybe those police officers weren't real either and the entire thing is staged. Either way, it occurs to me that if you um, set up a fake MI5 character, you know, playing um, and, um, an inspector, um, should any nonsense, you know, be taken to court, um, you can play it all out that this character really exists and in the end sack him, as in sack the, the person, you know, and it's um, no one is affected, you know. Um, so it's, it's always a, um, a kind of a favorite um, with government officers that they say, oh, well, yes, we looked into it and we didn't find anything, you know, unusual, as Karen always says, you know, they in investigate themselves and don't find anything unusual. But then they say, oh, yes, well, we, you know, we removed a couple of people, you know. But if it's just fake identities, then you haven't even sacked anybody. You know, the, the entire thing is a facade. And as a victim, you, you have absolutely nothing to hold on to. It's all just fog and mirrors, you know. Um, so I, after this in interaction with Inspector Misko, I'm tending to assume that this guy isn't real, that he's a fake persona. And then, you know, um, I was I was talking to the other investigators on the team and it occurred to us that actually Misko, if you spell it out in capital letters, um, the first three, um, M-I-S, literally look almost like M-I-5, you know, because in these names, they, they kind of encode um, who these people really are. And then someone pointed out to me that, you know, it could be standing for M-I-5 kill, you know. Um, that's what it really stands for. Um, yeah, and then the question arises, is this guy really running the electromagnetic um, warfare unit and um, is, is a person, an assassin and his team actually responsible for the attack in me, uh, on me in Manchester? Heck knows, but it's all um, fog and mirrors. Either way, this is one of those leads um, for the people of Manchester and um, so I will, what I'll be doing next week, um, by next week, is publish all my correspondence with Greater Manchester Police, publish this phone call so we have a voice sample of Inspector Miskell. If this guy genuinely, um, you know, exists, I'm very sorry, but then again, he's given me enough nonsense that, you know, it's fair enough that I doubt the entire story. Um, and I really want people in Manchester, whoever, whoever, private or actually in official capacity can investigate this, to actually look into this, because I think this is one of these rabbit holes. Um, and, and we have to find out who these people are and what exactly is going on. 
Now, the other point I want to mention, and that's also a massive, um, actually, um, hole um, down the, you know, a path down the rabbit hole, is, um, as I said in the past, um, attacks, uh, mutilation of women, you know, attacks on, on women, and the abuse and murder of children are tightly interconnected. And this is why the, the reference to the great sacrifice in this Telegraph article is rather, you know, topical. Now, I also said in the past that if these two are connected, then every single time there's some sort of attack or electromagnetic attack or some, some form of mutilation like that, I would assume that somehow, somewhere, there should be a link to pedophilia and the murder of children. And to show you one example, for example, is, is you know, Melanie Richan, when she went to court, so Melanie, um, you know, she was infected with this um, bio-warfare, more gallons um, thing. She was heavily implanted and she had her son taken away um, when she com started complaining about the implants. Um, now, when she went to court um, about this, um, the judge who then ensured that the, her child was taken away was, um, I think, later accused by um, a, a surgeon, a pediatrician, of being involved in the pedophile ring. And this surgeon was then made on sectioned, you know. Uh, so there you see, I mean, you know, pedophilia just comes up as the, as the, the theme everywhere we look. And I was musing to myself that if Greater Manchester Police give me that much nonsense, and especially Ashton um, Police Station, um, and if it's true, and if this guy's really just an MI5 persona, you know, a fake police officer, can I, by just digging a bit around, find any sort of links to maybe pedophilia and the murder of children? And um, indeed I can, indeed I can. And, um, you know, <laughs> that's actually quite, quite shocking because one of the things I want to show you, sorry, I didn't bring it up before the show, is I want to show you um, a map of Greater Manchester, okay? And um, I want to, hang on, let me share my screen. And I want to show you where Ashton actually is. Okay, so uh, hang on. Yes, okay, here we are. So um, watch this. And this is, again, for all the investigators out there. These are really, really important links. And I think um, what I really ask all our viewers to do even you know, in, with investigators, I do not mean professional retired police officers or XMI five agents. I mean literally the entire general population who has got time to look into this. Um, just use Google. Honestly, I want to show people how much you can dig out by just using Google because you know, it's mind blowing. So let me share my screen, okay? And let me show you um, here. This is Google Maps, okay? I hope people can see. And this is Manchester, okay? Now, this here is Ashton. Ashton under line, under Lynn, whatever. Um, that's where I was. That's why I stayed in the hotel, okay? And the police station is somewhere on, somewhere here, uh, on one of these main, main roads. Anyway, so this here is Ashton, okay? Now, when you zoom out a bit, what you see here is um, some hills, okay, this green area, which is kind of, um, yeah, these kind of typical um, northern English um, hills. Maybe if I put it on satellite, you can, you can see it. So it's kind of, you know, it's not really forest. It's kind of this barren, um, typically English hills, okay, moors, this sort of stuff, okay. Now, the most uh, the most famous case regarding um child murder and pedophilia in manchester is something called the moore's murders okay these were children murdered i think in the um 1970s so let me just show you um here we are so these kids were murdered by Ian Brady and Myra Hindley, um, who've since become famous in Britain um, because they've killed a bunch of children after torturing them to death, pretty much. Now, at the time of their arrest, um, well, ever since, it has been presented as if these two nutcases have been acting totally on, the, on their own. They are just, you know, serial killers. They are just mad, and that's that. However, um, the rabbit hole opens up 
when you actually go back to the original um, cases and you read about the fact that this guy, Ian Brady, said in his very first, I think, um, police interview that he was part of a ring, that there were more people like him, as in he was part of a, of a violent, sadistic pedophile ring. Okay, and I think if I remember correctly the case, and now I really want the old police officers who maybe remember this case to really dig around because I think that this case is much bigger than it actually looks. Um, this is an accusation that he said once and then very quickly never again. All right, especially not after he was in police custody. It's almost like someone higher up really told him that if he doesn't shut his face, uh, he will die quicker than otherwise, okay? But he made this accusation that he was not acting alone, you know, in the very beginning. Now, this is an image of what the actual um, landscape looks like where the, the children were buried in shallow graves. So they were, um, you know, murdered after they've been tortured and they were, you know, um, dug away here. But what's very, very interesting is if you scroll down on the Wikipedia article to um, the map here of where the bodies were found, all right? Because I think the fourth child was never found and three were found. So if you look at this, this is Saddleworth Moor and there's body one, two, and three here. And then, you know, body number four wasn't found, um, but it, the search for the body was somewhere here. and, and um, uh, Ian Brady said, claimed that, uh, you know, the fourth body was buried somewhere here, you know. Okay. Now, if you remember the shape of the legs here, okay, and you look at Google Maps, and remember the, the names, Greenfield, Upper Mill, Diggle, yes? You go to Google Maps, let me put it back on Maps. The legs we're talking about are here. Here you have Greenfield, Upper Mill, and Diggle. So the bodies were buried around this road, A635, A and they were buried here and somewhere here. And this street is just up from Ashton. What coincidence. So I'm here in the police station. I'm reporting an electromagnetic attack on me, OK? The police decides not to crime it, as I've now found out, gives me a lot of nonsense and produces what to me looks strikingly like an MI5 fake police officer character, you know? And it turns out that just up the road, literally on this major road here, you know, it leads straight up to the most famous case of child sadistic murder um, in the history of Britain. And the key um, lead for investigators is the fact that Ian Brady said that he was not acting alone. I would say, being the most cynical, I would say the fact that the police here in Ashton is giving me so much nonsense and it seems to be such a well, very well-oiled machinery indicates that the police is very close with MI5, very, very close. They seem to be very schmoozy, doing favors for each other. Um, and the fact that the Moore murders happened just up the road, and the fact that Ian Brady said that he wasn't acting alone, and the fact that these pedophile rings haven't been investigated by MI5 for absolutely decades, seems to imply that MI5 is running these pedophile rings, right? Now, I would, I would say that the nonsense that Ashton has given me is indicative of the fact that they're causing to MI5 and the fact that these more murders happened up there. I would, I would say as a hypothesis, why not investigate the fact, you know, the possible fact that Ian Brady was actually working for the MI5 pedophile rings as a, as a sort of hypothesis to check why not whilst we're at it because I find it just a bit too much coincidence um, that all of these things come together. It's literally just up the road, you know. Um, so for the people in, in the US, this is just um, totally, you know, off the, um, off the beaten path. But one of the things um, that um, I want to say is that 
for the people of Britain, this should be a total oh my god factor. Okay, because there's I don't think anybody in Britain who hasn't heard about the Morse murders is one of the absolute biggest things. Um, and for the people of the US, I would say have a very close look at what will turn out of this. And also um, do the same thing in your country and say every single time you've got a targeted individual um, or some, some case like that, look for the missing children, look for the murdered children and look for the links between the two because there, there always are. So um, that's what I've got to say about, about that. So that was the, um, my exchange with Inspector Misko. Sorry, Ramola, in the meantime, is your microphone back? Well, we have to check that. Can you hear me? Perfectly. Oh, brilliant. Wonderful. I'm tired of hearing an echo, though. Are you hearing an echo? Oh, OK. All right. Maybe that was it. Uh, thanks. No, that is an extraordinary story, Catherine. And thanks for leading us through that. I have a couple questions about it. So if you don't mind unmuting your mic for a minute. Um, those more murders that you found out about, when did they take place? They took place, hang on, I always get confused if it was the 70s or the 60s. I think they were in the 70s. Sorry, let me just go back. So there's a Wikipedia article on that that people can read. Um, it's, it's just the Moore's murders. Um, and oh, yes, here it is. Between July 1963 and 1965, in and around yeah, Manchester. This is so astonishing because the way what you said basically and what you pointed to was that perhaps that too was a constructed event right it was a constructed even though there was an actual murder and actual bodies were found the whole thing was sort of ritualistic and how the whole thing was an event much as we are seeing these false flag events being played out today you know decades later with all of this masonic and satanic signaling associated you know, Ole was talking about how I think in the very last event in Barcelona, there was a picture of a little girl walking about with a shoe and oh, a girl wearing um, pink or purple. And that, he says, is the color of the event, the colors that they are using these days in the Euro, what he's calling the Euro spring events, the false flag events that are kind of sweeping Europe. And he says they've been accelerating these events lately because they're getting desperate. And they're trying hard to roll out chaos in attempts to get people to engage and become fearful and you know bring the vibration of the people down because and i think paul can attest to this people are waking up people are waking up around the world people are beginning to see precisely what you are talking about you know and as um you know seven also said this in her podcast with me as soon as these events start happening those of us who are awake are out there. We're on YouTube. Citizen journalism is on the rise. People are already analyzing, looking at all of the little clues and putting their thoughts and their analyses out there. You know? And so because people are waking up, these people appear to be getting terrified at the rate at which people are waking up. And they're rolling out more and more events instead of running for the hills, which is what I would advise, really because it's, their, their game is over. It's over, as far as I can tell, it's over for them. I think their hills are much more dangerous than you think. They're doing a job for, for a very dark force and they can't stop, they can't even, uh, even let it up. Pink and purple, that's a satanic thing. Uh, red and purple together, that's, that's always a satanic thing. And the more, it was interesting, uh, during the Bilderberg meeting, I think it was last year, uh, I interviewed Oli right, right, right after the event. And they had staged the, uh, the Orlando Pulse nightclub shooting. Uh, and the Orlando Pulse nightclub shooting is so full of holes. You don't have to be a seasoned investigator to see that it's a false flag. I mean, people are being carried away from uh, the hospitals, no ambulances. I mean, it was, it was a real joke. And it was made a joke because they wanted to get the truth community off of the Bilderberg meeting onto something else that they could get their teeth into. So they're manipulating us by making the false flag events even more false flag to lead the lead uh, the truth or community away from the mainstream media community and make more of a, a division there. 
So as we get more and more sophisticated and we wake up more and more, they're dumbing down mainstream media people more and more to alienate us. I mean, a really good example is this uh, Charlottesville false flag. <clears throat> this was a staged, it was an orchestrated event. Supposedly, uh, the uh, Black Lives Matter people uh, and the, uh, Antifa. The, right, Antifa. the right wing, well, the Antifa, but the right wing came in the same bus. They oh, had different uh, shirts uh, on, but they all showed up in the same bus paid by, we must assume it's Soros because we know that he pays them good money to do that kind of thing. So both sides were set up. The police were told to stand down to allow that to happen. So they had a fight. So now the media comes in. The media says those right wing extremists are the people we need to watch out for. And they won't even allow Trump to say anything against Antifa. So it's, it's becoming, uh, it's coming to the point where they don't even need the event. All they need is the media coverage of the event. Uh, there was one in Munich that followed quickly on the heels of uh, the nice. one in Nice. Mm -hmm. Both filmed by the same guy, supposedly just a guy who just dropped in for them, who just happened to be married to a, uh, a Mossad agent who was, she was also a member of the Israeli uh, parliament. So yes, they are being staged. And yes, we are waking up. We can see them from, well, first of all, nowadays, the people that are awake, when you hear an event like this, you immediately go false flag. I mean, you don't immediately go, oh my God, what's happening in my country? No, you know, it's a false flag faced by, uh, faked by the CIA, mm -hmm. Mossad, and these production companies that are, that, you know, in all these interviews, I'm sure you covered, I have many times with them, how they have a, they have a crew. They have a place where they do makeup. Yes. They have, they seal off the streets. You can't have, uh, they'll never do it. They always do it in gun-free zones in the U.S. because you don't want any of your actors getting shot, actually. They, uh, they're valuable people. They use them over and over again in these different false flags. So if you're awake, you go immediately for, oh, it's a false flag. But now they have us, see? They have us going in a direction that they can, they can take us. But it's really nice to know that people are waking up and uh, we can see the connections from all the events. And there's no reason that these false flags happened after 911. I think they've been happening all the time. I mean, the Lusitania during World War I was a false flag. Uh, Alistair Crowley claims to be involved in that false flag. So they've been doing this, manipulating us the whole time. The difference is, and this is the important difference, the difference is we're waking up and we're waking up in mass. That's why they shut me off. I suppose that's why they shut me off of this uh, Google Hangout channel. I can't yes, access that's, my. That's right. Yes. That's because, right. We've got to have freedom of speech. Um, We've got to have that now that we're all awakening, and it's and they're really in danger. I really think I really think you you and Ollie read it precisely right. Uh, they see this mass awakening, and uh, they're going to now when it, when a, when a rat gets cornered, it gets ruthless. So that's what we can expect now. I think coming from them, uh, they're going to be more outrageous more police state, more shutting down of YouTubes and channels, more um, more attacks, just general illegal yes. on people. I think that's what we're going to see. And uh, Unfortunately, we're starting to see a little bit of that, aren't we, uh, Paul? And maybe you want to talk about how exactly they shut you down and why, and which particular video of yours the YouTube didn't appear to like. OK. Um, mm -hmm. This video has been up for like three or four months and watched by a lot of people. It was passed over all over uh, um, Facebook and apparently there were groups 
that coagulated around just to discuss these video, this video. Because this video, uh, when the Super Bowl video of the Audi commercial came out, uh, I was talking to Ella Garib, the mother of the two children in the Hempstead cover. -up. And she uh, said that her and the, uh, the grandmothers, my grandmother and the grandfather, identified a girl in an Audi commercial as being their daughter. And they were pretty, pretty positive about it. So uh, we wanted to release the information. Uh, Ella said, that's fine. And we have a person, a, a close friend of mine here, who's a real, actually a professional in the field of video making. And so he took what Mindy and I had already done, what Mindy had done, let's, let's be honest. And uh, he uh, modified it and polished it and put it on. And he uh, drew parallels between the uh, biggest child trafficking event of the year, which is the Super Bowl. Nobody's ever denying it. I mean, it's cited in maybe 10 or 12 different articles on that video. By the way, if you want to look at that video, you can do a, go to our account on VidMe. I think it's the only thing I posted there. If you go to Pinecone Utopia channel on VidMe, you'll, you'll still be able to see it. And we're going to repost it on other channels also. Um, but it, it just exposed the child trafficking. And, and coincidentally, it, it implied that the children that were supposedly killed in Sandy Hook that showed up 13 months later to sing at the Super Bowl were probably fodder for the same mechanism. It implied that. We didn't say that, but it implied that. So we're, 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 we're uh, encroaching on their uh, sacred events. Uh, pedophilia. Uh, they don't want you to know much about pedophilia. We've been covering for a long time and have a lot more videos on pedophilia. But uh, this one is, is one of the better ones. And also, they don't want people who are beginning to wake up to go to channels like uh, Pinecone Utopia and be able to catch up within a couple days of what's going on because we've covered these events, vaccines, cancer, uh, medical industry, and all that stuff. Plus, now we have Crime Stoppers Forum on there Techno Crime Stoppers Forum, which I think is the most bombshell thing happening on the internet. You can see, you can get millions of people, uh, even alternative people, I don't mean millions, I mean hundreds of alternative channels, parroting what's happening to Trump, Trump versus the deep state, what's happening in Syria. It's all a puppet show. What we cover here on Techno Crime Fighters Forum is they're using current weapons. They're using current mind control on people. And this is what's happening. So I think Techno Crime Fighters Forum is the most dangerous podcast on, on the internet. My, my opinion, and I'm, I know I'm biased, but uh, I think it's what's happening. I think that's why they want to kind of push us more into a corner. And for me, and I know Ramola, and I know Catherine, and I would assume the other two. Uh, members of the joint investigation team are going to just be energized by this, as I am. Because I know people are waking up and I know they need this information. Mm -hmm. so, and you know, Paul, and you, know Paul, you point you to something point that's very important. Mm -hmm. Technocrime Fighters Forum is really cutting edge, primarily because we have people who are coming forward and reporting this intense 21st century crime using neuro weapons and using electromagnetic weapons which mainstream media refuses to to pay a listening ear to because it's very clear to me now they are very much a part of it they are very much a part of the cover-up they're working with the state they're completely collaborative they're completely complicit and they are seeking to stamp out these voices from around the world speaking out of whom we are just you know the, the tip of the iceberg we are perhaps representative in this tiny space of thousands, possibly millions around the world, who are being hit with electromagnetic weapons and neural weapons that are being rolled out in, in operations and experimentation projects by intelligence agencies, by militaries, by governments, all in an attempt to suppress people, to suppress communities, 
to create, as Dr. Eric Hallstrom was talking about, explicit terror and implicit terror. And he takes that, I think, from Doug Valentine's book uh, in reference to the, the Phoenix program. The explicit terror is what you and I are being hit with, Catherine, with the actual weapons. And the implicit terror is what's being fed to our communities who can see what's being done to us, who are condoning what's being done to us, and who are keeping quiet as this is being done to us, and as media is keeping quiet about what is being done to us. But it's the absolute cutting edge. It's the absolute reality of this time period in history, where people are being hit with extreme weapons that are actually covert weapons by the very nature of their operation. They're radiation weapons, they're sonic weapons. The beams are invisible. And it's in connection with nanotechnology, with the extreme use of nanotechnology on humans around the world, and also heart technology, ELF te technology. And this is where mind control beams being sent down into our human brains, which are very susceptible to external ELF manipulation, are being affected all around the world. And the reason they don't want um, people to talk about this is, what, is they want to keep these weapons hidden, because the weapons are a means of control, right? So they can continue to control populations, just as the false flags are a means of control, creating terror and chaos among populations and communities. So it's all of one piece. But they need complicity and they need uh, collusion. And the media is here to provide that collusion and that cover, as you say, Paul. And you know, more and more, the media is being ranged against the truth-seeking and the truth-speaking community. I think that's absolutely correct. And, um, and um, there's several things that they're trying to keep hidden. In the first instance, it is these weapons, because I believe that these weapons um, are planned to be used in, in a mass genocide of, of all upstanding um, and um, people of integrity, you know. Um, they, they really have a plan, I think, to wipe out absolutely everybody who is um, going up against the crime cartel by slow kill weapons, by, as you said, these radiation weapons, um, which are mutilating people gradually and bringing about a, um, a, um, a, well, what's it, an early death. Absolutely. And I think on, on, on one level, they first want to keep these weapons hidden, the, the silent assault weapons, the silent murder weapons, then the neuro weapons, which, um, you know, don't kill you quite as fast, even though they still irradiate your brain and give you brain tumors. Um, but at the same time, those weapons can be used to entirely change people's emotions, opinions, their behavior, and they are the most powerful weapons we have. Um, but then on top of that, I, I always think about these weapons as the kill and the, the opinion change weapons. And the question is, what are they trying to hide when they try to kill us off and they try to um, you know, change our opinions? And I think um, one level up is exactly this sort of pedophilia and the, the, the rape and mutilation and murder of women and children and also some men as well. Um, that they in turn use to produce the control files on all the people, which includes, as we now know, Supreme Court judges like Justice Scalia, um, but also other people in the military and in the intelligence agencies all throughout, and also people in the media. Um, and, and then the question is, what is the, um, you know, pedophilia in turn used for? You know, what are they, what is this structure that is using pedophilia control to control everybody. And we already moved um, you know, to that level and we said, oh, well, it's some international organized crime ring. They own the intelligence agencies. It's a global organized crime operation. Um, and one of the things I wanted to suggest, I have one, one footnote, you know, I've got like three points to make. Number one is, um, you know, you two were absolutely right that all these staged events are used um, to cover up crime and also to terrorize us and to change our opinions. Now, the question is what to do in the face of these things. And number one is to totally debunk them. And every single time there's a staged event to figure out how they are done. And by now we know that they hire crisis actors. They even use, you know, job advertising sites to hire crisis actors. And I somewhere I've got even the printout of one of these um, jobs that went up. You know, they were looking for crisis actors. And I think that was before Jade Helm. So, you know, but they go up before all these false flag events. Um, so that's another thing for investigators. We can get our teeth into that. We can also find out who in the end they hired because those people are also guilty of high treason because they took part in these staged events. And because these events are then wildly 
uh, widely reported through the media, which as you all pointed out is complicit, no one can claim, none of the crisis actors can claim that they did not know that what they took part in was anything but actually a high treason action. So that's them gone. So all these crisis actors with their mugs on film, that's just perfect. We just have to find them somehow over Facebook and they are up in court. Um, and then, um, sorry, one of the things I wanted to say also is that, so debunking these events is number one. Number two is to learn their methods to debunk these events faster and faster. And that has already happened. I find it beautiful that my field of physics took 15 years to publish a paper debunking 9-11 and saying that the laws of physics do not allow 9-11 to happen as it was portrayed to have happened. It is physically impossible. So therefore it was staged, you know, by the government. Um, so that took 15 years, but to debunk the whole Joe Cox um, affair took, I think, a total of eight hours. Because, um, by the way, in the chat, someone corrected the mistake I made because um, Joe Cox, uh, the supposed murder of Joe Cox, um, happened not in London, but in Bristol, in, I think, Yorkshire. And I think it was um, Janice Bredrick who pointed this out in the chat, and she's absolutely right, because now that she mentioned it, I remember. And the reason why I got myself confused is because I was actually going to the high court trying to save my own life. Um, so it was my second hearing, and things were rather blurry at the time. But I remember that I heard about the su supposed murder of Joe Cox in the offices of Private Eye which is this um, magazine that comes out every two weeks um, and it's supposedly, you know, publishing whistleblower material and all that. And I was actually in the offices of Private Eye trying to get Private Eye interested in the systematic murder of British people with electromagnetic weapons and they couldn't give a flying finch. They couldn't wait to get me out of the office. But whilst I was there writing, I had my court bundle there, which I left for private eye. And I said, please call me. And I left my mobile number. And I said, there's a lot more in this that I can't put into writing right now. Please call me. Um, and I explained to the secretaries that British people are being murdered in large numbers. And, you know, that this, these are crimes against humanity and something needs to be done. And they couldn't care. So I find private eye at fault as well. Um, I think they should be taken to court for aiding and abetting high treason and crimes against humanity and mass genocide as well. Um, now, but at the time I was in the offices when um, a lady um, called, oh God, Jane McKenzie, um, she was one of the ladies who was downstairs. And whilst I was writing into my court bundle, you know, notes for the journalists to call me, she suddenly says, oh, I think an MP um, was just stabbed. So I heard it in the private eye offices that this MP was supposed to be stabbed. Now I flew back from London that afternoon. I left the private eye offices just before five o'clock and I went to um, London Heathrow. I flew back, I was attacked on, at Heathrow um, and I flew back. Um, and then by the time I got home, I just typed in Joe Cox and false flag. And there was a fantastic video up on, online already debunking the BBC um, news reports about this. And I thought, fantastic. Now, this really shows the power of networks, you know, because we network information, it gets faster and faster. Um, and, and we will just take these things apart. And the final thing I want to say is that we will take it apart, we'll learn how they do it. And then we need to go a step further and go after them and start rolling up. As Paul said, these things have been happening for a very long time. And we now need to go back in time and claw all these cases back and say, look, if you can pull off this, have you pulled off something like that there as well? And just for the British investigators, just because on today's forum it has been topical, I want to bring up another set of murders where I've got um, insider information that I would like to share with the public now that I think is very important and should be followed up at some point. I mentioned the Moore, Moore's murders in the UK, and there was something else, also very famous murders of two um, young schoolgirls um, called the Soham murders. And I would like to share my screen and I would like to make a couple of very important points about that. So after I explained how the more murders are maybe not what they are all made up to be and might be actually much deeper, I also want to draw people's um, attention to the Soha murders. So you can find them on Wikipedia. And um, what happened, and this is the official story, is that um, two um, young schoolgirls called Jessica Chapman and Holly Wells um, were supposedly murdered, they, their bodies were found near RAF Lakenham, 
uh, sorry, Lake and Heath in Suffolk in, uh, on 17th August 2002, okay? And it was said that the school caretaker, Ian um, Huntley, murdered them, okay? So this is the story, all right? Now, one of the things that doesn't quite add up about the story of Ian Huntley, and I think there's an entire book written about this, which I unfortunately haven't read. Um, so this is Ian Huntley, the supposed murderer, and people were pointing out that actually maybe the story isn't quite full. Um, so please, if you can get hold of the book, please do read it. Um, but one of the things I personally know about this case is um, I was at Hartford College at the time in, um, what was it, 2000, did I say 2002? Yes, and he was convicted in 2003. Now I think in 2004, or maybe at some, some later point, um, I was at Hartford College and the expert who was um, drawn in to testify with a key bit of evidence was a professor at Hartford College, a professor of geography called Peter Ball. Okay, and the way they convicted Huntley was, as I was told by Peter Ball, amongst others, um, they tried to search his car for DNA traces or anything and they couldn't find nothing. This, this car was supposed to be scrubbed by Ian Huntley so that there was absolutely no DNA evidence of the bodies being transported in this car. But even though the car was totally scrubbed, on the bottom side of the car, they, um, he drove over stone, supposedly, as he dropped off the bodies, and the, the stone um, scratched the underside of the car, and the particular deposit of minerals could be precisely located by this professor of geography who has an entire map, as he told me. He, he says he has, like Sherlock Holmes, an entire map of Britain where he knows what sort of minerals there are in different regions. And he could point, literally pinpoint um, this thing precisely and, and have um, Ian Huntley convicted on this evidence among others. Okay, now I'm just telling you guys what I heard from Professor Peter Bull himself telling me in Hartford College. Now, what's wrong with this story? I mean, apart from the fact that, you know, it just so happens that there's one scratch that happens to be, you know, such specific minerals, you can pinpoint it such that you can convince somebody. I mean, that's, that's like so many freaking coincidences, it blows my mind. But then again, I'm not a geographer, I don't know how specific these minerals are across the UK. That aside, when, when Professor Bull was talking to me about that, and at the time I knew nothing about staged events. My first thought was, hang on a second, this guy is a school caretaker and you tell me that he managed to so deep clean his car from the inside that forensics couldn't find a shred of DNA evidence? Are you telling me that a caretaker can pull this off? And I was there in Hartford College thinking that to me sounds more like a job for special branch. And looking back, I have to say, the more I know about the intelligence agencies and special branch, the more I think this was a job by special branch. So um, somebody, I think, pointed out that this guy might not have been murdered by Ian Huntley, but in fact by a psychopathic soldier from the RAF base who murdered the children and dumped their bodies just outside the base. And then because these people in the military are protected and perhaps because it was also part of a human sacrifice ritual, that these two children were kidnapped and murdered, it might have been covered up. But either way, I want us all to take all the bullshit these people are giving us and, and literally interconnect them and go from Inspector Miskell, who gives me nonsense, to the Moors murders, to the Soham murders, and start rolling it all up. And actually, this is, I think, the only way we can get back at this crime cartel. And I think that's a as well. And that's why she pulled together this incredible legal legal looking document where she's, you know, put all the evidence together about the Grenfell Tower fire and she's demanding that action be taken, pointing precisely to these kinds of extreme anomalies whereby people in high places supposedly in positions of authority are stepping forward in some minimal way and putting a face to an inquiry which is very uh, limited in scope and in nature and doesn't appear to go forward in any way and doesn't appear to come up with names of people and companies to hold responsible, to hold accountable. 
And I think the point that you're making here, Catherine, is yes, you know, we, everybody around the world right now is doing a great job figuring out these false flags, and it's getting faster and faster. But we've kind of, as humanity, as a, the truth community, need to come together more and more and go to that third step of saying, look, this is what's happening. These are the people who are involved. Let's name them. Let's put their names down on paper. Let's read out their names on air. Let's inform each other around the world. Let's network. Let's get really courageous. Let's take that next step. And then we start holding them accountable. And, you know, this is precisely the question that came up in my podcast with Ole. I asked him, you know, people watching us may bulk at this point where naming is involved to name the chief of police in your town who's complicit, to name the editor of the local newspaper who's working with the local Masons, you know, who's, who's part of the Masonic Guild, who's working as a Satanist, to name these people as complicit and accountable. People balk at that because of the legalistic kind of society in which we live in, defamation laws, libel laws, slander laws, etc. So what do, you, what do you say to that? I asked Olay, and Olay said, you know, the stuff is shit scary. But you got to have the courage. We humans have got to step up to the plate at this point in time because our children are being murdered. Our families are being killed. Everybody, all of us are being targeted in many different ways. You know, when are we going to say, no, this has got to stop? Yeah, and I think also the way around this is to say, look, these are the things I'm noting. It seems to imply that so-and-so is guilty. Could we please investigate? Because right now we have the situation where the police, um, you know, provably refuses to investigate. They absolutely refuse to investigate. And I'm of the opinion that this organized crime cartel, um, you know, that's referred to as the network of global corporate control, but I think is more the mafia, um, what they have done is that over that you know over decades, if not centuries, they have bit by bit replaced um, genuine police officers with fakes and outright criminals, and they've moved them into places. And right now, I for for example, another thing to report is that um, I tried to get through to the FBI again in the case of Millicent, you know, who is again <laughs> again the military, you know, being um, assaulted by an Air Force um, veteran. Um, and FBI Memphis hung up on me three times already last time when I called them in March. Now I called FBI Knoxville and they too hung up on me three times. So I had to literally call them back three times before I could even report the crime. Now for me, this is not an FBI outfit. This is a front for organized crime. As far as I'm concerned, the FBI is, is not functional. It's just a front by now. It is. And, you know, there are people from the FBI who've spoken out about it. And Ted Gunderson, special agent, you know, from L.A., uh, has recorded it several times on video uh, and as well as in, uh, in writing. He's written an affidavit to show that the FBI has been infiltrated. And, and we know that at this point. We know the FBI and the CIA have been infiltrated in this country, you know, by the Masons and the Satanists. Who are running the show at this point you know they are what we call the deep state and they are sort of moved around like puppets just like you know the president is also a puppet by the shadow government and kevin ship recently had this conversation i think dane wigginton has posted it on geoengineering watch where he is, spoke to a large audience and he showed the difference between the shadow government and the deep state the shadow government he says are you know the money the money holders the bankers, the guys at the very, very top who keep themselves totally hidden. They are pulling all the strings. And, um, you know, they're running the puppet show of Congress and the president's presidency. And they're also running the puppet show of the intel agencies. And they're, because they're inside the intel agencies, they are agents, the shadow government's agents are in the, in, inside the portals of every single intelligence agency. So when we look at intelligence agencies and how they reported in the newspaper, the, the complicit colluding newspaper, um, you know, you, you see the, the facade operation. You see the words that they choose to put out there. But you don't see what's going on inside those intel agencies, which, as you say, Catherine, are in capture by these agents. And that's the deep state. So those guys, the, the Satanists and the Masonics who are working inside the intel agencies, are sort of 
pulling a fast one on the rest of us, on, on the intel agencies themselves, as well as on all of us. And, you know, as far as reporting crimes goes, especially in the area of being targeted with these weapons, I wanted to make one important point about language. And I know we've come back to this on and off a few times. And it has to do with this notion of the targeted individual, as we were talking about earlier, Catherine. So when people in America or in Europe go to the local police station and say, look, I'm being hit with energy weapons. I'm being hit with radiation. Look, here's my meter. I can show you how I'm being hit. I'm being burned. Lasers are hitting me. Masers are hitting me. The police responds by saying, you need a doctor. I'm calling the psychiatrist. You know, I'm calling the prefet of the town. I'm calling the mayor. I'm calling the psychiatrist. The psychiatrist comes along and says, what did you say? You said you're being hit by what kind of weapons? Aha, delusions, DSM. Let me pull it out. Delusions of hallucinations, paranoia. This person is afraid of everybody. And then you have the New York Times coming along saying, you know, what a pity the surveillance state has produced these monstrous aberrations in humanity where people are showing up and uh, projecting delusions of being hit, projecting paranoia. These people most definitely have, have to be taken off to the psychiatrist and we're going to write articles about them and we're going to call our articles the United States of Paranoia. You know, so instead of, so the attention by means of that term targeted individual, individual and by means of that collusion between law enforcement, media, and psychiatry to keep this hidden, the whole attention has been focused away now from the military microwave weapon that is being used on people to the report and turning the, the attention on the victim, victimizing the victim exponentially by naming the victim delusional paranoid and psychologically inept, you know, and pulling in the psychiatrist. So that's where I think the stern targeted individual is a euphemism that's so insidious and that's so wrongful because what it does is, and with, with a term like that, the whole focus is moved into psychiatry and then you have the media coming and reporting on what the psychiatrist says. So the focus has been so dramatically shifted and it's so wrong because where the focus should really be is where the military weapons are, the state of the art regarding these weapons. These weapons are highly developed, highly sophisticated. Military units are currently using them. They are in operation. They are being tested. They are being experimented on. They're connected with nanotech, they're connected with neurotech, and they're connected, therefore, with departments and universities. And there are all sorts of contracts between universities and military branches and intelligence branches that are testing these modalities. And where those modalities are going, ultimately, is nothing less than total human takeover, by total human takeover of the brain. It's neuro takeover. You know, it's an, they're, they're heading toward biorobotizing. They're heading toward complete neural control without humans being aware that the thoughts that they are thinking are not theirs. And these are no longer, you know, these are no longer fantasies. All of our brain, brain uh, cogitations, all of our cognitive processes can be reduced to computer algorithms and to electromagnetic waves and can now be completely affected from the outside. That's the reality. And that's the focus that we need to be looking at. But with, the but with this term targeted individual, the reality that they are trying to, to inflict and project onto us has been dramatically shifted. I think it's a fantastic media because um, I think what they have done is that they have moved um, the focus away from the perpetrators onto the victims because it shouldn't be targeted individuals. It should be, if anything, victims of the intelligence agencies, victims of law enforcement, putting the emphasis on these thugs. And um, I think the way to fight back is, um, first of all, um, totally debunk this entire nonsense about, you know, psychiatry, number one. It's a pseudoscience. But number two, um, I would attack the police directly and say, look, we already have not just evidence that these weapons exist. We know um, the manufacturers who manufacture this. Now, if you are absolutely, you know, you are attacking every single person who comes forward reporting an attack with these weapons, what you're saying 
is even if these weapons exist, you claim that absolutely no one could possibly be ever attacked by them. Now, this is impossible because as soon as you have a pen knife or a sharpened pencil, right? I mean, all of us probably at some point at school were attacked by a sharp pencil, right? By some nasty person sitting next to us. So there is no, there is no weapon that doesn't have any victims. It's impossible. The entire point of a weapon is to attack somebody. So the fact that the police is claiming that, you know, these weapons have no victims is ludicrous. And the way to really prove that the, the police is acting criminally and that they are um, covering up, aiding and covering up and aiding and abetting crimes against humanity is to simply ask them for the statistics and say, officer, please tell me how many um, attacks with microwave weapons have been reported to your district. If it's a larger area like Greater Manchester, um, I know for a fact that it's impossible that no one in Greater Manchester was attacked and that no one ever reported a microwave attack. I mean, here's me, right, as an example. I've already reported a microwave attack to Greater Manchester Police. So anybody coming after, after me can say how many people have reported a microwave attack. What they did with me is cover it up, the entire report, and make it disappear from the statistics. But because these morons don't understand statistics, they thought they're getting away with it, but actually they have um, indicted themselves. Because now it's public that I reported this. It's also public that it doesn't show up in their crime report, which means that automatically they've been covering up a crime, right? And they automatically they are guilty. Um, and I think this is how to how to really get them. If people want to assist us, they can start putting out um, freedom of information requests to all police stations, or not just um, simple uh, little police stations, but maybe entire police districts like the Metropolitan Police in London, and actually ask how many attacks with um, directed energy weapons have been reported to you, and how many of those cases did you successfully solve. This should be part of the statistics. And they have only one choice, actually, which is to say that nobody reported any directed NG weapon attacks. Which you know, what, I would also, hmm? what I would also suggest, Catherine, along those very same lines is what people can do is perhaps report to us. They can send us a little note, send us an email saying, I've reported it to my local police. This is the name of that police station. Here's the phone number. So I, I'm in the US and I can pick up the phone and call every single police station and ask them that question as a journalist. How many people have reported microwave weapon attacks in the last 10 years? What is the response? What is the general response of the police station to such uh, reports? What is your policy? Do you have a policy about that? Is there a protocol? What do you do uh, to address those crimes? Because many people are reporting this. What is being done about it? So I can ask those questions because I really, really am very interested in this. And the other thing I'm really interested in is speaking to the police, uh, police in the local police stations and in all of our police stations worldwide, those police who are not Masons, who are not Satanists. I mean, do they exist? Are there policemen in these police stations who are not Masons, who are not into child molestation and child crime and child murder? No, you know, they all they all belong to the Fraternal Order of Police. They belong to the Fraternal Order of Police. So by means of this Fraternal Order, they are they're gagged? They can't speak? Yeah. Yes. So it might be pointless, me talking to these police and saying, look, join us? I don't know. I, I, I think that Oli is uh, pursuing the logical next step. I think he's suggesting that they come to our side. Yeah. I have a different take. I think, first of all, they're Satanists and psychopaths. They're not coming to our side. George Soros is not going to flip and come to our side. Also, I think there are a lot of players in this thing that are not human like us. Now, I know every time I say that, I, you know, how could this be? No, there are players in this whole drama that are not like us. Um, as you were going through, by the way, the crisis actors for Charlottesville, mm -hmm. uh, Catherine, the ad, uh, there was mm -hmm. an ad either in Craigslist or in the local uh, penny saver for uh, those people right before that. So we do have a trail 
uh, that that's happened. Also, with your uh, MI5, they've run the um, uh, Elm Guest House. And if you investigate the Elm Guest House, it's, a, it's an orphanage that was held open by MI5 to entertain politicians. Now, what kind of entertaining you do in a uh, orphanage, you know, you can let your mind uh, go crazy on that. I think uh, I would suggest a two-pronged attack here. And I know that we're still investigating, and I love it that every time I hear from Catherine or Romola, they're nailing somebody to the wall. I love that. But I would suggest a couple things. One, we need to continue down the rabbit hole. Because there are some people that think that there are broadcasting channels that actually are going to give you news, that aren't going to only give you information that benefits the deep state. That you've got to wake up to that reality. It's all about uh, the deception is so deep. And let me give you an example. There's a guy named Dave McCowan, and I don't know whether you've read his book called uh, Strange Scene at... Uh, at Laurel Canyon. It's about how the satanic elite created the hippie movement. It's an important, it's a must read. Dave McCowan, I don't have the name, the actual name. I think it's called Strange Steens at uh, Laurel Canyon, but it's about Laurel Canyon. Uh, he's a great investigator and nobody ever questioned his uh, research because he did open source. He subsequently wrote a, wrote a book called uh, Program to Kill, The Politics of Serial Killers. And in that book, he proves that the deep state created every mass murderer that was in the public's eye. And it was produced to create uh, the fear and the effect and what they needed to do. And of course, it's, it's connected to the satanic elite. And if you study uh, Jeffrey Dahmer, he did a microcosm of what they're trying to do with all society, remove the brain of people and make them hive mind. Subsequently, they had to kill Dave because he was he got too deep for the rabbit hole. So what I'm suggesting is that we continue. And I, I am totally amazed every week at Techno Crime Fighters Forum that you guys go deeper in the rabbit hole every week. I'm always blown away at how fast you guys are going down deeper and deeper into this uncovering thing. So I think that that's a real important thing that Techno Crime Fighters brings, in addition to nailing them to the wall like you do, Catherine, so well. Uh, also, I think we need to redefine authority. Our whole system is based on the authority of the doctor, the authority of the police, the authority of, uh, of, you name it. And we take our orders from that. Think of human consciousness, uh, the most magnificent unfolding uh, that, well, that we can even conceive of, and how authority affects that unfolding. It, de it deprives us of our free will because we abdicate to an authority. We've got to disconnect with the authority. The authority is the matrix. Your authority, when you're taking care of your health, you're the authority. If you go to a, an allopathic doctor, which I think you have to in the United States, I don't know, you're putting your health in this authority figure that you know is corrupt to the core. This, this medical profession, and you know, I love Ed Spencer, and I love what he's doing, and I love that he's breaking free of this, and he's exposing this, but this is a very corrupt system, the medical system. Journalists, oh, they're the authority, they'll tell us what happened. No, they won't. Know what the deep state wants you to know. It's, it's the hook, hooking into authority that keeps us powerless. We need to hook into one another, and we need to go deeper and deeper into this rabbit hole and hook to one another. I mean, I can point to 10 people that I trust in explicitly, 
to tell me what's happening and to lead the way and to help me down the rabbit hole. But none of them work for CNN, Pacifica Radio. They're all people I know from the internet. They're people like uh, Ramola Deed and Catherine Horton and David Beverly, who's working so hard to get down into the rabbit hole of what's going on. These people I trust and know, they're my authority. We're, uh, we're our authority. So I just want to kind of push us in those two directions. First of all, deeper into the rabbit hole. And only Damagard knows. He's looked at these things. He knows what's going on. Uh, uh, Eric Karlstrom, he's on our side. And he's looking deeply into what's going on. There, if you have to have an authority, that would be an authority. But I would, I would, I would make it a flat level in Clayford. We'll all together. Uh, when when Catherine and I first got together, we talked about the uh, ineffectiveness or the effectiveness, but the uh, um, the the capability of the triangular pyramid system to mislead us and lead us astray. We have to go back to the flat system, the community-based system of our community, the community of people that are waking up. That's got to be our authority. So I was sitting back having all these thoughts, and I hate to throw them all like blah, 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 like this and throw us off track because you guys were really nailing the uh, Manchester Police Department. And uh, Janice uh, was, was doing the same thing in the chat room. But uh, really, to look at the big picture and see where we're going here, we want to go deeper and deeper. We're human consciousness awakening from a long, long slumber. And we need to hope tell one another as we go into this. And the authorities aren't going to help us. We have to redefine authority the people who can help us, the people who are in our same plane. Okay, well, anyway, I, that's all I that's have. Brilliant. Brilliant, Paul. And I just want to make one comment before I turn it over to Catherine, because I'm sure she can take it away much more intensely. Um, I just wanted to say that's brilliant. And you're, that's very needed and very essential for you to say that at this point in time, because what we're exploring is solutions. Where do we go from here? You know, what is the next step? What can we do? Because we're all about changing this evil reality that we're all caught up in. And what you're talking about is we need to network with each other. We need to connect with each other. We need to communicate with each other. All of us who are awakening and aware and um and working to make a difference you know and we need to uh, share pieces of the puzzle with each other so that we can move together and and really bring this uh, satanic evil criminal system down right let me interject before catherine and i'm going to give you the floor i would really like to have a channel or maybe we can do it on dtube since that's a new thing where we get together and we talk about the awakening of consciousness. Because it's obvious. I mean, look at my chat room. Look at the comments. If you go back at the comments on all Techno Crime Fighters Forum, you can write a book on what's happening, how they're shielding, and how people are waking up. The evolution that's taken place just in the comment section for the last six months we've been doing this is remarkable. And it's got to be scaring these uh, satanic elites absolutely to death. I hope so. Okay. I hope so. Okay, girlfriend. <laughs> I <laughs> actually, um, I, I, I've got a couple of things to say because, um, but before I do so, I want to say hi to Karen, who's joined us. Hi, Karen. I'm not sure if she can, if she's there. If she Oh, if she can turn on Hi, Karen. I can barely hear you guys, so oh, I don't think you want a picture of my ear with me holding the phone up to hear you. Well, okay. See, at, at, well, least, we, at least we can hear you, Karen. So um, if you've got anything to report, just interject. Oh, okay. All right. Um, I do want to say that uh, I want to encourage people again um, I just got on here, so I'm trying to keep up with what you were talking about, but I wanted to interject that I do want to uh, tell people to keep doing what they're doing. We had an offer from a guy named Steve in Texas, who's absolutely a magnificent person. 
he's printing out some of the most important articles and he may have already done this or he may be going to do this. I'm not sure how it worked out for him yesterday, but he was going to print uh, out yeah, yeah. Um, several articles that pertain to this situation and go to this, the capital of Texas and wait and see um, Gomert and Cruz and other people who he thinks might actually care, you know. So he's taken his time and his effort to do something like that. And I think that's tremendous. And I also want to give a shout out to Barbara Stepp, who made a wonderful, wonderful video that she's put out. And um, it's, she's, she's very articulate, a very logical, wonderful case. But you can see the emotion and the desperation in her eyes. But still, this lady presents well. She's classy. She's intelligent. And I posted her video on my Facebook, and I told people, why don't you guys make videos too and say, I stand with Barbara Stepp and put them out just as she did because it, what she did was very powerful. And if people will jump on that bandwagon, that'll help everybody. And like I said, you know, it's not just one or two or five or 10 people. It's everybody because everybody has a contribution. And this, these two people have just added to the cause uh, you know, magnificently, and I thank them from the bottom of my heart. And I think Barbara Steph is talking about a petition, right, that she created to the president? She's trying to get the 100,000 signatures or something? I, I didn't catch that. I'm sorry. Oh, I see. Okay. Uh, should I speak louder? Will that help? Does that help, Karen? I'm sort of uh, trying not to yell, but a little bit louder currently. I'm hearing you a little better. I'm trying to get my iPad going so I can actually hear it. Maybe the iPad will will let me hear you without sticking the phone halfway down my ear canal. <laughs> oh, okay. So in any case, I think Barbara Stepp is talking about getting people to join her to sign this petition that she had created on the White House, perhaps, on the White House website. It's a, it's a petition to the president asking him to look into this whole uh, scenario with microwave weapons, right? Yes, I believe she has. Yes. Yeah, so that is definitely, you know, an important uh, initiative. Karen, your audio kind of cut out halfway. Karen, if you could, if you can hear me, and you can send that link to Ramola, she can list it below this video. If you're hearing me, Karen, I'll write you on the internal chat we have. Yes, and you know, I can also find it. It was on Facebook, so I'll tell you what, at the end, when we publish the video, I'll send everyone the link and we'll put it up there. Yeah. No, I, I think this is fantastic because um, what, what the entire Techno Crime Fighters Forum is about is, is to also present solutions for people to imitate, you know? Um, I would like, oh, sorry, is Karen saying something? I can just hear her microphone. No, I'm not. It must be just making noise. Yeah. Um, so, okay. Because one of the things I, I was also thinking about is um, I should put out the short video just demonstrating how we make the Techno Crime Fighters Forum, how we're using YouTube and Google Hangouts, because I want people to imitate us. Um, we need many more um, forums like ours, for I, whatever the plural is. Um, and we need many more investigators. And Paul is absolutely right. What this is about is um, realizing it's not just the medical profession and psychiatry and science and journalists whose authority is fake. It's also the police force. You know, they are fakes. And the intelligence agencies, they are fakes. We have to, and, and also the ambassadors, by the way, who I also tried to contact and they did nothing. So what we have to do is society has to DIY it again from scratch, and we have to be our own ambassadors, our own police officers, um, scientists and, and intel agents, really. And we have to do it ourselves, you know, the work that is frankly their job, um, but they're not doing it. Um, and I think what we should do is, is put out um, ways how one can, for example, run an investigation, how, how one can pick up leads, how one can present it, how one can collaborate with others. And, and really the express um, intent of this is for people to copy us. I mean, this is why the Techno Crime Fighters Forum is also published under the, um, what's it called, the Creative Commons license, because we want you to download this and upload it on your channel. 
and and you know truncate it and pick out the bits you think are important and most importantly please copy us you know there is no copyright on this format or on what we're doing and we need many more people we need people in every single european country to run and every single u.s state and all around the world to have their own version of techno crime fighters forum in their own language or pertaining to their particular area or state you know um, absolutely. And I think the guiding principle should always be um, when you're running an investigation, I think that, as we said earlier, you know, the focus is on the victims and the crimes committed um, against the victims. And that's where you have to start to understand the weapons and understand the nature of the crimes. But eventually the focus has to be on who's done it, right? Um, and, and also when you're dealing with things like intelligence agencies, the key question to go by is who has authorized this with police stations with government uh, officials and intelligence sure, and i think your audio is being messed with yeah we didn't hear the very last part of what you were saying maybe your last two sentences okay did you hear the rest yeah okay i i was saying that um when you're dealing i think i now remember what i said i i said especially i think when when you're when you're dealing with intelligence agencies and police stations, you know, and government um, um, officers, the key question to ask is always, who has authorized this? You know, with every false flag. I have, um, I think James Corbett put out some videos following up 9-11 and who has authorized all the different aspects, you know, of the, of the cover-up. And then that's exactly the sort of investigation we need to run. And the guiding principle is always who has authorized this. Because we know that it's a, it's a top-down matrix, it's all recorded, everybody's being tracked, even the perpetrators, and there are digital um, traces left, right, and center, and there are all these chain of command traces everywhere, you know? And we need to go after them, and ultimately, it's not about the victims. That's what the, the perpetrators want to keep us focused on the victims and the suffering of the victims. And that happened, by the way, um, on, in the Second World War as well. You know, we, we heard a lot about the suffering of the people in the concentration and the work camps, but there's not that much information on who has done it. I mean, you get to the top of the Nazis and no one says, yeah, but who funded the Nazis? You know, who got them there? And that's where the, you know, as Paul said, we have to now go deeper down the rabbit hole and we have to go on and on and on. And you know, regarding regarding the victims of those concentration camps, well, we actually do know where the top Nazis ended up, right? They ended up in cushy mansions in South America, and they ended up on the, in Project Paper in the U.S. They were given like the red carpet treatment right into the Manhattan Project and right into all of the ghastly projects that are currently being unrolled on us. I think we can safely conclude, although we don't have information to that effect in, in the public domain, that the people running these terror assaults with microwave weapons and all of that are the Nazis from way back, you know, been yes. proliferating in the US. I think that's 100% correct. They're, they're still, they, I, my take on this is that they have, um, you know, they have rebranded uh, the, the um, ideology of the Nazis, um, which by the way is virtually identical with the ide ideology of, of communism as well, where you had the gulags and actually communism killed more people than the Nazis did. You know, I think it was 20 million people who died, I think, um, was communist Russia and then, you know, many more in, in communist China or something like that. So, yes, and, and now I, you know what, I think about this corporate branding. They called it Nazis and then they called it communists and communism and then they rebranded it a bit. And now it's called Satanism, you know, and you've got and then Freemasonry and all the stuff. This is just corporate branding. It's the same nonsense as you organize, you know people into these these matrices and you get them to kill their own you know um so i, I absolutely and 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 it's all well hidden you see it, it's well hidden under officially legally Oh, I think, Ramola, I think your audio and your video is being messed with. I really hope you're not thrown, otherwise the internet forum is strong. Actually, actually, it's pretty well hidden in plain sight. If you look at Project Paperclip, they came over and started NASA, N-A-S-A, -S -A, with a big Z going over the top from the, uh, it looks like a snake's tongue coming down. So they just, 
They even call themselves Nazis, NASA, Nazis. And that organization is, talk about mind control central. I mean, they did not, you know, I question, and this is only me and this might be too crazy, crazy old guy. Uh, I don't, I wonder if uh, Warner Braun Vaughn was a, um, was a rocket scientist or whether he was a mind control specialist because he worked with Disney and he created this whole organization that lies. They lie. They lie about everything. And uh, I mean, that's, that's Nazis hidden in plain sight. And of course, they came over and they started, what was it, the OSS that morphed into the CIA. Yeah, it's, it's uh, the Nazis definitely won the war, but the Germans really lost. That's what I always say about that one. Uh, so as we get deeper down this rabbit hole, World War II is a great one to look at because all of the factions were financed by the same people, the shadow government, as Romola would say. And they're still operating today. They're the ones that are sponsoring the false flags. They're the ones that are, you know, it's, a, it's the same cartel. It's the same money. And uh, actually, the people that run this cartel Gates, Soros, uh, Trump, well, Trump's, Trump's a pump, but uh, all of these guys, you can still tune into mainstream media and they're interviewed like they're experts, like they're, like they're authority figures. Come on, let's wake up. These are misinformation agents leading human consciousness into really bad suffering and foul territory. So, yeah, I think, Catherine, you're exactly right. World War II is a good way to start. A lot, a lot of manipulation occurred through World War II. Uh, of course, the good guys won, and that put the whole world to sleep for 40 years. Now, as we start looking back and taking things apart, we're realizing, my God, this, they called them snakes in suits at the turn of the 19th century. Those same snakes in suits. Uh, are, run, are running the program today. And you have to realize that they have infiltrated all these authorities and they control you from these authority positions. So breaking loose from authority and start doing things ourselves. I'll tell you what, I've, I, I'm not much of an investigator. I, I have even trouble doing research. But these, this type of crime fighter group that Catherine Romola and Karen have assembled here. What an amazing investigative team we have. They go really deep. They're not afraid to confront people, call people. They're doing the job. And they're uh, and that's why Techno Crime Fighters Forum is so dangerous. That's why I lost my uh, uh, probably entree into Google. This is the most dangerous podcast out there, I think. Well, just this minute ago, Paul, when you were talking, everything sort of seemed to flicker and blacken on my screen. I was afraid I was going to lose the whole show, all of us. And I think Catherine started saying something, oh my goodness, I'm afraid we're going to lose it. I think she was saying it to it at her end, right? And I couldn't move my cursor, and you were talking, and I had just mentioned counterterrorism and ISIS and Al-Qaeda and terrorism. Error, and then you jumped in and started talking about you know standing up to authority and uh, Catherine saying we have to become our own authorities, which is absolutely right. I mean, you know, just listening to both of you, I'm so psyched and so pumped up because you're right. We have to be our own journalists, our own scientists, our own investigators. We have to step up to the plate here, and we have to be conscious, educated, aware human beings. You know, and we need to connect and network with each other. And one of the things that I what about all actually the ways in which I could possibly personally contribute. I have been for a long time playing around with the idea of, you know, entering the consciousness space and starting to interview people in the, in the consciousness world. Uh, but I kept thinking, oh, I have to set that aside, do this work first, and then after some time, maybe do that. But now I'm thinking, to heck with it. I'm just going to interview everybody. I'm going to just, you know, do it all as if I'm at the center, 
because I'm, I feel I'm awakening and I'd like to speak to others who are more awakened and who know what they're doing and who've been researching in different fields. I'd like to talk to all of them and you know, bring them all into the mix. I, I, think, I think that's exactly what you, what you have to do, Ramola. I think this is absolutely fantastic. You know what, I, I think also through this process, we realize who we truly are. Because as we are, you know, we need we need um, help. We need people to join us, and as people do join us and they 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 help in whichever way they can, they actually learn themselves what they can do, you know. Because frankly, what I've seen, I think so far we have done a better job of doing investigative work, of police work, and and also because this is an international um, investigation doing what, frankly, the ambassadors should be doing, you know, liaising between countries and countries' own personal interests. So, you know, if it's hard, I always try to tell people if it's hard on certain days, it's because we are doing the, for, the, the work of the FBI, of MI5, of the Metropolitan Police, and of these blimming ambassadors all at the same time, you know? <laughs> and what the hell are they doing? But, you know, actually, one of the things I wanted to do before we finish, just very briefly, I wanted to um, to give people leads and um, almost give people like something like homework or interesting leads to follow. And because we were talking about um, about Britain, I want to um, talk about the City of London Corporation and some really really interesting leads um, that also will lead back to pedophilia and many other things. And um, Ramola and I were talking um, before the show, and because this topic is so vast. I don't want to hog the Techno Crime Fighters Forum with just the, the British case here. Um, Ramol and I were talking about maybe doing a dedicated um, uh, video about, about this topic where we explore it further. So one of the things I want to do just within two minutes is give, is give people a taster of what you can uncover just by using Google and your own brain. And then maybe take it further with Ramola in a dedicated podcast. So if I if I may just share my screen, I would like to do what Paul asked us to do, which is to dive down deeper into the rabbit hole and really go after the roots of this. Um, and I want to first of all open up with um, just the article that I was mentioning earlier. So when I talked about um, in this case of Inspector Miskell and how odd it was and the fact that he appeared at the funeral that seemed to be coded and have all this symbolism. I was referring to, you know, various symbols and I couldn't point people to the picture. But what I was referring to is this article in the Daily Mail entitled, A Little Girl in Mourning for Parents She Adored. Daughter of PC Fiona Bones, partner joins family and thousands of officers at shot policewoman's funeral. Okay, long title that pretty much says all you need to know. So at this funeral, the, the relevance to my case is that at this funeral, um, Inspector Miskell spoke. But look how this was reported in the Daily Mail. The very first image here, this is the daughter of the, um, of the lady who was um, murdered. But she's shown as a little girl holding a five-pointed star. That's the very first image. And she also holds her lips as in, you know, this is a secret. So keep your mouth shut, you know, hold your lips. Five-pointed star, Satanism, you know, a pentagram, Satanist symbol. If, if this is the very first time you see these coded events, it, will, it can be just pure coincidence. But trust me, this really isn't. Because if you scroll down further, this is an image of the lady who's died. But then in the Daily Mail, pretty much the same image of the mourning family is shown three times. So look at this. First time, the mourning family again. And then here, the morning family again. And this time, these two people look straight into the camera. And that's the hand sign that I was referring you to. Now, if you're not familiar with Masonic hand signs, this looks like nothing. But when you have the five-pointed star, the same image three times, and then you have this hand sign, it really means something. Okay? So this is the article I was referring to, and then it goes on and on and on. So. This is, I think, for all investigators, um, an article um, with symbolism to cut your teeth on, you know, to kind of train yourself up what to look for. But the actual real leads I just want to quickly race through, literally within just a few moments, are the following. I was talking about the City of London um, and the City of London Corporation, and I, I realized that many people do not know what the City of London is. So what you see here is Google Maps showing you Greater London, okay? 
So Greater London is this area here between the M25, that's Greater London. But if you zoom in, there's an area that's called the Square Mile, and that is the City of London, okay? Now, when I talk about the Crown Corporation and the City of London as a front for organized crime, I'm talking about this area, which is tiny. It's called the square mile because it's roughly, the area is a square mile. Now, this are, these are the old boundaries of London. And it includes, you know, the Tower of London is here, this boundary. And um, you have the old Barbican here. There was once a Barbican here, which is why the um, art center um, is called the Barbican, right? But what you also had um, were city gates around the old um, part of London. I think here there might be some old parts of the city wall or something like that. So you can see the old um, area. But this is very, very important because the city of London is special. It's not like the rest of London. So Greater London is policed by the Metropolitan Police London. But this area, the city of London, has its own police force. Okay, so how special is that? And this police force the, of the City of London is totally separate from Greater Manchester Police. If anything happens to you here, it's reported to that police force. Okay, now the other things to notice about this um, area is that it includes at the very heart of it the Bank of England. So you've got the Bank of England here and you've got St. Paul's Cathedral right there. Um, these are two very, very important places, okay? So that's one thing to note. The other thing to note is that the City of London on this end here, um, first of all, it includes something called Fleet Street that um, used to house all the journalists, as in the media in the olden days, along here, Fleet Street. But also, in this area, you've got all the inns of court and actually also the Royal Courts of Justice. Now, the way it's drawn on Google Maps, because Google Maps follows um, the street layout, is as if the City of London boundaries are here. Now, I don't think they are running through there. I think the City of London also includes this other inn, inn of court, the Lincoln Inn here. I think the boundaries of the City of London Corporation cut straight through the Royal Courts of Justice and go straight up here, okay, to include all of Lincoln's Inn. That's another, the Inns of Court, um, so the, the barristers are associated with these um, Inns of Court here in London. So in other words, the City of London pretty much incorporates the press, the lawyers, the barristers, half the Royal Courts of Justice, right, the Bank of England and St. Paul's Cathedral, amongst others, okay? These are very, very important landmarks. Now, leads for the investigators to look into, right? And can you guys still hear me? Sorry, yes. can you guys hear me okay? Okay, yeah. then let me, let, let me show you one, a couple more things that are super, super important. Um, so this is, I, I'll elaborate in later episodes of Techno Crime Fighters Forum, but things to note about this is that, so as I said, the boundary of the City of London goes, you know, up here, not as it's shown in, in, um, on Google Maps. When you, when you zoom in, these are the Royal Courts of Justice, okay? And I'm saying that the boundary cuts straight through the Royal Courts of Justice. And the things to note are that this building complex here, let me zoom in, that building complex that's kind of separate from this, that houses the Queen's Bench Division. Now, the Queen's Bench Division. It's like this bit, the bench is a reference to the courts, to the, to the judges, right? It's almost like this part are the judges of the Queen, the Queen's Bench, and then the question is what the hell is the rest, right? And it's not explained anywhere, but it's really odd that certain parts of the courts are called the Queen's Bench because it implies the rest is the bench of something else. And I'm, I'm putting to you that the rest is actually owned by the Crown Corporation. The rest of the courts are wholesale owned by the Crown Corporation. And one of the things to note, for example, if you go up inside the city of London, there's something called Fetter Lane, and then you've got this big law library here. And in this building here, is what's called the Rolls Building. 
those are the commercial courts of the Royal Courts of Justice and the commercial courts are entirely placed within the City of London, right? Because commerce is entirely ruled by the Crown Corporation, right? So when I went to the um, famous court case of Berezovsky versus Abramovich, where I started to be openly targeted by MI5 for the first time, I was inside this building here, deep inside the City of London. So I'm just putting these things out and just to finish off, I'll just want to point people to the demarcations of this City of London um, um, territory because the entrance points, the main roads inside the City of London are marked by dragons. Remember what Paul says about the snakes, right? Dragons looking like snakes. Um, so every single major road has um, a boundary dragon and there are I think a total of 10 of them, okay? So people, have a look at what these dragons look like. So the city of London, boundary dragons look like this. They are these scary looking dragons, right? With a, notice the red tongue here, what looks like, you know, a red cross uh, under the wing. And then you've got a red cross, white run. Yes. Can, can you hear me, Ramola? Can you I guys? I can hear you. You can, you can hear me? I can hear you. Okay, then I'll just, con Ramola, I'll just continue as if the rest of the um, chat can hear me. And I'll just finish off. And maybe it's just Ramola's end that's being um, sabotaged. But this is super important, which is why I want to point people to it, because there are some clues hidden in these dragons. So have a look at the dragons, people, because they are holding something that's a, a, a red cross on a white shield, yes? And includes um, a red, um, a red um, sword on this crest. Now I said there are 10 dragons. You can find more about these dragon, the dragon boundary marks on Wikipedia, okay? So these are cast iron statues of dragons, you know, um, that mark the boundaries of the city of London. And I'll put the links into the, um, into the, um, what's it, the description below after the show. But there's a site here that actually has a picture of all 10 dragons. And now look carefully, because when you scroll down, this is the first dragon here, they look almost identical, but there are two dragons that are fundamentally different. So quiz question, right? Which of the two dragons are totally different? One of them is really easy to find, so they're listed here, but the second one is harder to spot, right? So um, this is Bishop's Gate, um, Blackfriars Bridge. So all these dragons look pretty similar. But then there's one dragon, and that's the one that's really easy to spot, that it looks totally different. So I'm scrolling down through all these boundary da dragons around the city of London. And the one that's really easy to spot is this one. This one looks fundamentally different from all the other dragons. And this is the dragon that is right in front of the Royal Courts of Justice. This is what's called the Temple Bar Dragon, okay? The Temple Bar. And it's called that because um, the temple used to be the um, temple of the, um, uh, of the Knights Templar in London, right? That's an old church. That's the temple. And the Temple Bar used to be a boundary between the City of London and the rest of London, okay? And Christopher Wren, also an important character, actually designed um, the original temple bar and that used to look like this. This was the boundary um, that you had to drive through to get into the city of London, okay, um, in the 17th century um, and actually uh, all the way into the 19th century where they took this and moved it next to St. Paul's Cathedral, okay, and they replaced the temple bar, but this is what used to bar people, right, um, from the temple, and they replaced it with a dragon that's facing outward, right, and is actually um, glaring at people, snarling at people from behind the cross. But this is what one of the dragons looks like. It looks like this one is special. Something here outside the Royal Courts of Justice is very, very special, okay? But I want people to go back and look at all the other um, nine dragons and find the second dragon that is 
also different from all the others because that again is um sorry it's this website here the second dragon is also showing something very 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 special okay so that's the homework for people um for the next episode to find the um the second dragon because all of these dragons are actually as paul said hidden in plain sight and they are pointing at something super important that goes to the root it goes to the heart of this entire cartel i think these are the clues for the investigators to look into since we're talking about london let me interject the fact that uh during the eclipse, you know, they stopped Big Ben. And Big Ben's going to be stopped for, uh, I think, three and a half years. It's going to come back online 2021. Now, three and a half years uh, to uh, Christians might mean the tribulation, which is a three and a half year event. So uh, we can look forward to Big Ben coming back in 2021 in the spring solstice i think that's that's the way i interpret it but it's real interesting and now there's deep research being delved into on what caused the eclipse um, what really caused the blackening of the sun this time because for the first time in history we've got scientific analysis being done on what exactly obscured the sun and and that's still to become, it's just coming out now, but it'll be interesting because that's going to um, give us breakthroughs in knowledge about how this whole universe looks and how it works. And we're living in exciting times and it's, you know, it's great to be awake. It's great to be awake during these times. Um, Oscar, uh, anyway. Well, we should Case, case in point, Paul, I was just bumped off entirely, like three times on my computer. Everything froze. And I was aware that I'm broadcast. I didn't touch the stop broadcast button at any point. I, I tried to leave messages and could see them because I was. Yeah. It happened. Nonsense was going on. And <laughs> yeah, I mentioned, I mentioned IQ and. Uh, Catherine, right, and, or, or, and I were going to have some real enlightening conversation, I think, and they cut off the electric. So, uh, so we're, we're not insignificant to them, that's for sure. We should really try to start signing off, uh, Ramoli. You're in charge. Uh oh. I think I think Ramola has been just frozen again. So um, I think what we have to do, I don't know, we have to wait for her to come back or, you know. Oh, she says. She looks like I can hear you, Catherine. Okay, okay, you're still there because Paul just said. Um, that, okay, so she says that she can't hear your audio, Paul, but she can hear me. So what Paul just says, um, Ramola, is that we need to start signing off and you're in charge but you know your audio seems to be um messed entirely so i think um this time maybe we just sign off like this you know we we um draw people's attention to all these um all these many links that highlighted today that lead down the rabbit hole we encourage everybody to become their own investigators their own um you know police inspectors and um you know intelligence agencies uh, intelligence agencies Oops, I think, um, say it again, Ramola. And oh, and, um, I just said, and also look for alternatives to Google Hangout because they're doing a good job of freezing us today. Exactly, and everybody start looking for alternatives and suggest them to us. Um, and yes, and what we want is people to, to imitate us and we want to spawn many, many, many different um, fori where people talk about these crimes and go down the rabbit hole. And I think together we will we will actually get to the bottom of this much faster than anybody will have ever thought possible. And I I hope that they understand that the deep state and the shadow government understand how flattered we are with all their attention and all their their loving care, and they're not going to stop us. They're not going to stop the awakening of consciousness. Um, they better get done what they what they need to get done because uh, 
they're not going to be long. And that that for that for that's that's my sign off kind of thing. Uh, Ramallah, you're the one that has to stop the train. So uh, if you're there, you look you look frozen. You look like a she looks like a beautiful mannequin in a in a, in a window or something. Yes, I, I think she was just thrown, and now we're in this um, awful situation where the person hosting the show has been frozen, <laughs> and I was in this situation before, and I'm not sure if there's a way to actually cut the broadcast unless you manage to um, sign back in. So uh, <laughs> this is... Um, what, what, I know what happens, because this has happened to me before. What they do is they allow the people that aren't the, the hosts to go for about another two or three minutes, and then they they shut us off. So we should say goodbye, Catherine. And uh, why don't you, I know you'll have something to say. Why don't you say something, and then and then we'll both sign off. Okay. So um, one of the I, gosh, you know what? If if they give me two minutes, I I can keep um you know pointing people to this. But I will. I just want to say this thing with the boundary dragons is super important. It ties in with everything that we said today. It ties in with pedophilia. It ties in with the establishment. It ties in with um, you know the targeting, and it ties in what you were saying, Paul, which is going right to the core of this rabbit hole. So people should take it very seriously. And the one thing to keep in mind also is that um, this targeting now is very very new to us. But the the as you said, Paul, they've been staging events for for absolutely ages. And this entire system that we're now uncovering is absolutely ancient. So all its hidden clues and signals are, have been there throughout the centuries. And um, actually, one can go um, globally and look for clues, but one can also go back in history and look for clues. And one, one gets closer. Is that what's happened? Yes. I'm just seeing people's back. logos. So they, they throw on you, but they, they kept the broadcast. Is anyone there? Anyone still talking? Yes. Can you hear me, Ramola? Can you hear me? Oh, I, hi, I, Paul. <laughs> hi. I'm trying to find a video that we made several years ago about, about swans, about black swans. And, uh, you know, Lita and the swan. Well, anyway, swans is... That, that's the whole emblem of the royal family. And, uh, and these white swans are the emblem of the royal family, and they say the, the birth of the human race was Lita and the swan. And so I took that a little bit further and I said that the swans might, might not actually be swans. They might be more dragon-like winged creatures that started this whole... Uh, satanic, psychopathic race, race on the earth. If I can find the, uh, the video we made, I will send it to Ramola and she can uh, post the link on her, on her channel. It's been quite a while ago. And, uh, sure, I'd love to. Can you guys hear me? Oh, good. Because literally all sorts of mayhem was being unleashed on this side. I couldn't hear you. Your audio was being broken up. And I was talking. Nobody was you know, paying any attention. So you guys figured it couldn't hear me. I opened the chat room, it was disconnected. And the screen just totally vanished. This, happened, this is the fourth time it happened. Yeah. Yeah, it's so, it's so flattering. It's so... Uh, <laughs> we must be really at the top of, you know, speaking out in the world today. If we are getting so much close attention. It's encouraging. It's so encouraging. Um, I, I don't want to continue. Uh, to make this any longer so i will try to send you my swan video and the soundtrack is worth it by the way we did a good job of the soundtrack we repeated uh, the theme from uh, swan lake over and over in different forms uh, and so if i can find this um, wonderful yes we should post that video <laughs> I'll have to go back and listen to this entire techno forums the latter half again because I missed most of it. I was uh, busy being, you know, bumped off. Yeah, they're playing rough. They, they are. are. This is what. Well, it tells me more than ever. I need to get off Google Hangouts. You know, I need to find an alternative to Google Hangouts. It's very convenient and everything, but if this is what they want to keep doing to me when I'm online on air.
When we first did this, uh, David Beverly suggested something that can be done similarly through Skype. Uh, you know, Skype is mm -hmm. owned by Google also. Yeah. There'll be other things. I actually signed up with gotomeeting.com, um, Paul. So I have that, and I'm going to start running my podcast on that and just start recording on my desktop, I think. Okay, but yeah. They, if they don't, uh, here it is. It's called Swan Song for the Control Matrix. And uh, I mean, it's a pretty optimistic ending in the video, but uh, I'll copy it here and I'll put it in the, uh, I'll put it in our chat and you can list it. Uh, here it comes. I like it because it's got, uh, it's got great music and uh, I, I might have been a little off. But I better uh, take that while I can before I'm bumped off again. Yeah. Because you know some of the older videos for anybody, if they're if their older videos are totally accurate, they're not waking up. Mm -hmm. I was wrong is a sign that you're waking up. Not, well, I was right in '95 when I said, no, that's not waking up. That's just bullshit. What 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 the evidence of waking up is? My God, was I wrong about Pacifica Radio? My God, was I wrong about the medical profession? But that's the sign of the, the awakening of consciousness. Uh, that's my two cents on it anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anyway, I well, that you can... It's entertaining. It's entertaining. Mm -hmm. Hopefully informative. Great, thank you. Yeah. Um, well, this has been a fascinating conversation. We've gone all over the place, and I think I missed Catherine's entire lecture on the Dragons of London. But you know, Catherine, as you, I think you started to say at the beginning of that, I really would love to do a separate podcast with you, and we can go into that in detail. Yeah, I think we should because that entire topic is a total, total bombshell, you know, and it leads to many, many places. It leads back to my alma mater of Oxford. It leads to Cambridge. You know, it, it, that is a, is a total rabbit warren. Yeah. And it's all back to the City of London and the City of London Corporation, you know, the Crown Corporation. Yes, um, sort of heart of the action. I mean, it's very hard to tell which is the heart of the action. Is it Switzerland? Is it London? Is it whatever, Absolutely. but... Um, Yes, London's very central in any case, right? Absolutely. But I, I was just looking at the time. I think we for today we have to sign off while, while we can. Yes, <laughs> and I think all about time, we just had a quick sign, so I, we already did our sign off round. So why don't you, because I've just seen Karen has left the chat, why don't you oh. do a roundup of um, you know, what you were talking about and then you, know, you sign I off? See. Well, I guess at this point, all I want to say is I'm so glad I was able to get back into this hangout because I was bumped off so many times. <laughs> and I'm glad to know you both are still here and I can talk to somebody instead of into a cavern. Um, so um, as a first try at kind of hosting a live event on my desktop, I guess this has told me a lot of things about how closely I'm being watched and how my desktop is being monitored and stopped. So... <laughs> So invite, I invite everybody who's watching to please subscribe to my channel, to please watch my podcast, because I am just on the starting edge of this, and I'm very, very interested in talking to experts in every field and continuing to open up the space and the conversation, just as Dr. Paul, Paul Marco is doing, and just as Catherine Horton is doing, Dr. Catherine Horton is doing in her on her own channel, um, you know, which is just, uh, we're trying hard to reach the world um, educate the world, share what we know, uh, call out to people, tell them what really is happening as we discover it, and ask you all to come on board. So, you know, please subscribe and that's, um, and you know, there's, um, listen, to, listen to the podcast and read the articles at my website. And I know I don't often do this kind of plug thing, but I just thought I'd throw it out there this time. Oh, Paul, I think your audio is off. We can, uh, you can just push, like, stop the podcast, and it'll yeah, automatically yeah. make it public, and then we can chat. Okay, all right. So I guess at this point we're ready to sign off. Can you hear me? I, th I think Sorry? I think we're ready. Okay, wonderful. I think we're ready to sign off. So bye, everybody. Okay, great. Well, thanks for watching your time. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.